Uh, my name is Nick Gold. I'm the VP of Marketing at Catalog. Don't worry, I have a quasi-technical background. I was actually with a systems integrator that worked with the media tech space for 15 years, doing data storage systems, media asset management, workflow automation. And then I had the opportunity to join really one of the most unique startups I've ever heard of. And so I thought I would go for it. Well, what does Catalog do? Um, I get that question. Nick, what are you up to these days? Well, Catalog is building computers out of DNA, which sounds a little heady. Um, and you may have heard possibly of the idea of using DNA as a data storage medium, um, but we're actually taking that a step further because we actually think the computing potentials of a, of a DNA platform are very exciting. So to flesh that out a little bit, a tad, it might leave you more confused, Catalog is building a synthetic DNA-based storage and computing platform that harnesses DNA's inherent ability to store, analyze, and operate on vast sets of information in parallel to solve the technical, environmental, and economic challenges created by the exponential growth of data. And that's a little bit of a mouthful. So usually the response I get to that one is, you're doing what now? Yeah, we're doing that. So the, the people are like, okay, you, you wanna like solve the world's data problems. Uh, why DNA? Why would you use DNA for such a thing? So before I get into answering that question, let's just take a quick peek at computers and what we've been used to in the realm of computing, really for <laughs> since there's basically been computers that we think of contemporary computers. So uh, let's look at today's computing architecture and what we build computers out of. These days we make computers out of some pretty interesting things. We make computers out of essentially sand in the silicon processors we use. We use metals, glass, plastics, a lot of interesting molecules that we've, we've kind of uh, cajoled into doing these useful things for us. And, and this is an illustration of really every computer that you've ever used, every computer that's really been in service to us for many decades now. And this is referred to as a von Neumann computer. And it's really pretty basic, you know, ignoring for a moment the input devices and the output devices. A computer really has two primary components, right? A computer has storage devices where the bits that either represent our raw data or the programs that we're executing reside. And obviously we have multiple tiers of storage device, but you can think of this as the storage. And then we have processors. Right? We have the CPUs, the GPUs, the FPGAs, but really we have these two primary components. And I'd actually like to draw your attention to something that often doesn't get a ton of focus. It does obviously in certain technical realms, uh, but it's this bit right here. These little arrows that are really connecting our storage or memory to the compute elements of a computer where those bits are processed. A lot of people don't realize this. This actually represents the most significant bottleneck in computing that we've been dealing with for decades. In fact, it's referred to as the von Neumann bottleneck, and it's really inherent to a von Neumann architecture computer, because basically we pay a significant penalty in moving bits between the storage tiers across a bus into and out of the processor where obviously those bits are manipulated or executed. And we don't think about this because obviously we have much faster computers than we used to. We have super high speed storage devices. Maybe that's brand new NVMe, you know, flash storage. We have, you know, super powerful, you know, CPUs, GPUs, you know, specialty processors. But the one thing that really hasn't kept pace with this is the connecting lanes of the bus that still has to move these bits between these totally separate units in our computers. Again, we've, we've just taken for granted over many years, computers have these two separate things, where the bits live and where the bits are manipulated and we always have to move them between these things. So uh, bear this in mind as we get into what some of the potentials of using DNA as a computing platform are. So, you know, I would actually challenge folks to say, you know, why not DNA? Why, why wouldn't we use DNA? And I'm gonna just illustrate this with something that you can pull up in any textbook. This is a simple illustration 
of what's happening inside of every cell in your body every time it replicates, and thus as part of that replication process, the DNA itself needs to be replicated. And this is something we you know, learned in eighth grade biology. And I really recommend actually looking at some of the really cool computer graphics that have been created even just in the last decade or so. Because you can really see this illustrated in you know, a real time fashion, you know, really well done. And it really brings this to life. So you're looking at you know, DNA strands being replicated. But I'd like to call your attention to a few aspects of this. In fact, it's several things in here that all tend to end with arrays. We have DNA polymerase, we have DNA ligase, we've got topoisomerase. You know, all of these things, what are they? They're enzymes. And you know, when you think about DNA and what goes on both through gene expression, through the DNA replication process, what you can really start to think of is the fact that DNA isn't just a static storage platform for biological genomic data. It's actually being computed upon constantly. It is a computational medium, quite literally. And I'll just give you one example. Every time the DNA within your cells is replicating, which is going on inside of us all right now, we're all actively computing right here, um, there is a little enzyme that checks and actually does a, essentially an error checksum, and it makes sure that the DNA is replicated properly, and if not, it repairs it. You know, this is in many ways quite analogous to what we do when we do checksums to make sure that our data has copied properly. This is literally happening in all of us at every moment. We don't have to think about it. It's totally natural. It's inherent. And this is why I would submit that DNA really is nature's three plus billion year old data platform, both in terms of data storage and data processing. And it really is this kind of a converged platform that works quite a bit differently than these von Neumann computers we've been working with for many decades now. So I want to look a little bit at what some of the utility of using this platform, both on the storage side and the compute side, can be for us. So we're going to start on the storage side. It's the left-hand side of this chart. You know, DNA, first of all, you know, one of the things that's attracted people to it as a storage medium is that it's really, really tiny. I mean, we're talking much tinier than the uh, mechanisms we use today to store digital information to the tune of a million times smaller than the theoretical data limits of both solid state and magnetic based media. So just think about this for a moment. Picture a data center. It could be the size of a small town. And think about all of the data that that might store, probably in the exabytes, certainly. Now imagine that you could have an exabyte of data in the volume of a sugar cube. It's pretty crazy. It, I mean, it's really, we've never seen a, a million X jump in any aspect of computing before. It's, it's actually kind of shocking. Or in one data center, you could have a million data centers worth of data being stored. And you know, some of the uh, back of the napkin math that I've seen is basically in the back of a hatchback, the volume in the back of a hatchback, think of a Honda Civic, you could store in DNA form, if you were able to get it all in there, all of the data that humanity has ever generated through today, including the analog era. All of the information could fit in the back of a hatchback or a small coat closet. So that's pretty nice for a storage medium that we're talking about something that's very small. Um, the redundancy of DNA is another really appealing feature because you don't just have one copy of your genome. One of the ways that nature kind of has built redundancy into this platform is that we have many, many copies of our DNA in a, in a biological organism that's in every cell of our being. And this is part of the reason we can have the full genome sequenced of a woolly mammoth that died tens of thousands of years ago. There may be errors that have occurred um, as the DNA you know, sequences have gotten a little out of whack over you know, tens of thousands of years, but we have millions and millions and millions of copies of those, of those genomes, and so we can always kind of compare them to one another, and sequencers do this, and say, okay, well, we can pretty much statistically know that this is probably what it ought to be. Um, so the redundancy is very useful just from, from protecting data, 
But it also, again, and I'll get a little more into this, from interrogating the data perspective, it really gives us this ability to not only have essentially limitless information in a very small volume, but actually be able to attack many copies of that data set simultaneously. And when we work with DNA as a, as a, as a data mechanism, we're never just making one copy of a DNA sequence. It's actually pretty easy to do many, many copies at once. Um, I was talking about kind of getting the genomic data out of something like a woolly mammoth or you know, many other things that we've dug up out of the ground. Um, and again, a part of that is because of the redundancy. But the other thing that we like to think about at Catalog is that DNA is always gonna be a relevant data platform as long as we're still a biological organism that cares about DNA or cares about other organisms' DNA. Uh, you know, think about it this way. You know, when, what's the last piece of digital storage media you had that either had a shelf life of more than 20 to 30 years in absolutely ideal conditions? Maybe this is something like an LTO tape, you know, stored at Iron Mountain or whatnot. Okay, maybe the manufacturer will tell you that this thing could last 30 years, but I've sold a lot of data tape systems. I never told my clients that. I told them this has a functional life of maybe closer to five to 10 plus, because you don't know for sure in 10 or 15 years of the developments of computing technology, whether you're gonna have an LTO whatever tape drive or whatever generation of connector you're using, whether that's FireWire. Remember FireWire and how great that was? We, we haven't used FireWire in years. It could be different generations of ATA buses. It could be all sorts of things that we basically come up with better versions of every few years. So we can't ever really count on any piece of media being useful to us for really much more than a five to 10 year window. Again, as long as we care about DNA and have the ability to sequence DNA using sequencers, um, we have reason to do this as a species, this is going to be a data medium that will always be relevant to us. And in fact, we can probably assume we'll get better at, and better over time at utilizing it, at sequencing it more quickly, et cetera. So on the compute side, you know, we have a number of, of really interesting attributes as well. And I was talking about this earlier. In computing, we've always had this bifurcated realm of compute and store and this massive penalty we pay that we don't feel on a day-to-day -day basis maybe as users, but really it is holding back what any given computer can do at a given moment is the having to move the bits in and out of storage to the processor and back. And in DNA, as you kind of saw in that illustration, we can actually interrogate all of the bits directly in the DNA form. In fact, imagine that every bit of data that might be stored as one of the letters of a DNA sequence. You might remember we have four letters in DNA, the, the four nucleotides, A, T, C, and G, that represent those four chemicals that make up the DNA polymer molecule. Well, imagine that we're storing data in that kind of arbitrarily, and I'll get a little more into how we do that at Catalog in a moment. But now imagine that you can kind of send in processing molecules and attack the entire set of DNA data simultaneously and maybe across many copies as well. That's pretty unique. There's been these ideas for a number of years about in storage computing. Can we bring the compute closer to storage or in memory computing, which is similar? Can we make the memory and the compute closer and kind of you know, tighten up those latencies because it is such a penalty we pay. We have none of this in DNA. We can actually have these biomolecular interactions that are doing computation directly against every bit of data stored in a DNA sequence simultaneously. That's pretty radical. Um, the other thing about that and what that allows for is this form of almost scale-free parallel computing. Because if you think about it this way, it's very easy for us in the lab, so to speak, to kind of brew up more copies of a molecule that might, again, through an enzymatic process, perform some kind of a computation against data stored in DNA form. Well, you know, think about this. These molecules are stored in liquids. Imagine, uh, you know, liquid handling robotics that are combining to test tubes, essentially, and this is how we expose, say, a DNA set of data molecules to these kind of programmatic enzyme molecules. Well, you're kind of flooding these molecules against one another, and based on the laws of thermodynamics, all of these particles come into contact with one another almost instantly. And again, 
that would happen at really the same speed if that you know, volume of DNA data was an exabyte or a terabyte. It, there, there are no kind of additional penalties we have to pay to process more data in this way. Again, that's a very radical departure from how we've been used to using computers, which is that for every bit of more data you need to process, it's a fairly linear or sometimes even super linear uh, relationship with how much compute you need to bring to bear to process that increasing size of a data set. So you know, the fact that we can kind of use the same amount of stuff, maybe more copies of the molecules, but have this all happening simultaneously regardless of how much data is being processed, huge deal. And again, DNA has some very interesting, we'll call them native attributes as a molecule. And again, I would submit if some, you know, maybe robotic civilization came to Earth and looked at all of the molecules we use, I talked about sand and metal and plastics to build computers out of, and they said, okay, humans have all of these molecules to work with. You know, what's the one that makes the most sense to build a computing and data platform out of? I think they'd probably say, oh, this DNA molecule seems to be it. It's what nature designed to do this very set of things with. So DNA has, the, again, these very interesting native attributes such as this. You may remember in, in the language of the DNA alphabet, A's always match to T's and C's always match to G's. And what's interesting about that, again, and this is really based on the laws of thermodynamics, if you create single-stranded DNA and you actually design them to have complementary sets of those, those pairs of nucleotides, they will essentially find each other almost magnetically in a solution. They will self-assemble. And then we can actually shore up those assemblies with these enzymatic processes that lock them together. But think about this from kind of a data query perspective. Imagine you have a certain pattern of data in a DNA data set, and you want to find that piece of data in maybe an exabyte of DNA data. You could design actually other DNA sequences that essentially have a complementary set of nucleotides so they will latch on to the underlying DNA data patterns that they're sort of designed to find. And you may not realize this because I was not a synthetic biologist up until you know, four months ago, not even really exposed to what was going on in this space. I'm from a systems integrator, right? So you know, I learned they can actually attach things like magnetic probes to DNA sequences. So once a design sequence has latched onto its complement, you can essentially isolate that, pull it apart, and then you can actually sequence just that piece that you've isolated. And so think about this, you know, when we do queries across data sets today, there's this very expensive process that's called indexing that has to occur. And you have to essentially picture a needle in a haystack. And if you want to find a piece of data in a, in a data haystack, first, in order to you know, execute a query and have the response come back quickly, it feels like that's very easy, right? It's not. It's because all the data had to be indexed first in order for that query to be executed so quickly. So imagine having to go through every stalk of hay in the entire haystack in order to find, okay, here's the needle that I'm looking for. It's clearly different. So then when someone searches for needle, okay, it can be quickly found. Well, imagine you didn't have to do any of that indexing and you could essentially stick a magnet into the haystack, find the needle, suck it out, and be like, there's the thing I was looking for. We can essentially do that molecularly with DNA data. So, you know, again, very interesting molecule for humans to use for, for data purposes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how people have been working with DNA for data storage for a whole long time now, about seven or eight years. Actually, I will say, the idea came about actually in the 60s, not too long after we had kind of found and isolated the DNA molecule. In fact, in the late 60s, people were like, this would be the perfect thing to use for computers someday in the, the far, far future. We're here, we're here. <laughs> Welcome to the future, everybody. So this actually started to pick up more over the last seven or eight years. And I'm gonna put this illustration up. And what this shows you is how in the lab for the past eight-ish years or so, they have been able to chemically synthesize artificial DNA. Again, something I didn't know was a thing up until about six or eight months ago. And so uh, on the left here, and this sort of illustrates 
this chemical cycle that has to occur. Each of those circles really represent one of these nucleotide chemicals, an A, a T, a C, or a G. And there is this chemical process that you can use. Again, this is artificial DNA that has never been inside of a living organism at all. It is inert. It is not alive. It just happens to be a synthesized copy of the DNA polymer molecule. And you, again, might remember A, T, C, and G. A common way that people have sort of thought about mapping binary data to you know, quaternary DNA data is a fairly rudimentary mapping scheme. Maybe because we've got four letters and we've only got a zero and one in, in binary, maybe we'll make them zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. So essentially each nucleotide could store about two bits of information. And then other folks have kind of done erasure coding uh, techniques on top of that to build a little additional redundancy in. Um, but it's this very, you know, frankly, self-evident kind of an encoding scheme where you just have four letters and two numbers and this rudimentary mapping. So think about it this way. If you have a unique binary data object, any random file that someone wants to hand off to you, and you have to go through this process to create an artificial DNA sequence that represents that original uh, file, you have to go through this process of adding every A, T, C, and G in the very specific order that matches the original binary data object. And again, that sounds great. Isn't that wonderful? You can go to a website and send them a text file of A's, T's, C's, and G's and get back a test tube. Again, another thing that we have now in the future. Um, the problem with this is that every letter you add using this chemical process, tens of minutes, tens of minutes to go through this chemical synthesis process. And there's really no getting around that. Now, you can create many copies of the sequence at once, but you're only going to be able to add with that resolution, that granularity, one at a time, and it takes tens of, uh, of minutes per letter. So imagine a write rate of tens of minutes per every two bits. Not really that scalable. And there are some techniques that are starting to actually look at enzymatic approaches to kind of speed things up, but it doesn't have the accuracy, and again, it's not many orders of magnitude faster. Um, and you know, again, over the last seven or eight years, including at Technicolor, there was a, a paper that was published um, where they encoded probably in the low megabytes a very small movie file into synthetic DNA that was created in a similar fashion. Um, the biggest published work of capturing a digital file in this way to DNA uh, took place about a year and a half ago, and it was about 200 megabytes of original data and the estimate is, is that using one of these commercial DNA synthesis services, it probably took at least a month to write out to the tune of about $800,000 street price for 200 megabytes. Again, cool that they can do that, not super useful for us as day-to-day -day computer users. Um, so this is what we've been stuck with. And catalog, and frankly, this is something that caught my attention. I was researching DNA data storage because a geneticist friend of mine put this bug in my ear about nine months ago, and he says, Nick, have you heard of using DNA for data storage? I was like, yeah, on a Star Trek episode or something. And he's like, no, you should really look at this. These things are picking up. So I was doing research, and this company that I now work for, Catalog, really stuck out because they, they realized that was not going to scale. There was no way we were going to turn that into something that could store meaningful amounts of the big data that humanity is generating. You know, the estimates are now 175 zettabytes per year by 2025. You know, okay, you know, 200 megabytes in a month for 800 grand isn't going to keep up anytime soon. Now, this next slide is a little heady, and I don't expect everyone to walk out of here today with a perfect understanding of how catalogs technique works, because frankly, it took me a few months to really catch up. But I want to illustrate it in this way. Think about the fact about that earlier encoding scheme that I talked about, where you have, again, this fairly you know, self-evident rudimentary mapping or encoding scheme of zeros and ones to A's, T's, C's, and G's. Um, the folks at Catalog realized, wait a minute. Encoders can work many, many different ways. We don't need to encode binary data into DNA in that fashion we could come up with a different type of encoding scheme. Because at the end of the day, what you have to create is entropy. You have to create a system that has enough complexity within it that can store arbitrary amounts of complex human information. Again, the underlying binary data objects. 
So Catalog took a very different approach. They said, you know what, we've got some density to spare. We don't necessarily need to realize the absolute maximum theoretical density of DNA. What if we were willing to give up a tad? Maybe even just like around an order of magnitude. And what if we came up with this way of doing it? Imagine we go to these services where we can get this synthesized DNA created for us. Again, they can get you bulk copies of sequences, but it's just much more economical to get very short DNA sequences. So imagine we build out a library, and I'm gonna use some round numbers here, and frankly our encoding scheme is quite extensible, so it doesn't have to work quite this way. But imagine we come up with a bunch of, let's call them DNA sequence components. And let's say they're in the order of a couple of dozen base pairs long. And let's say we create a library of hundreds of those. And maybe, you know, they're double-stranded in the middle, but we give them these single-stranded overhangs on each end. And we come up with a very specific, totally, you know, programmatic, known in advance way that we can combine these hundreds of components into these longer, what we'll call identifier DNA sequence molecules. And so this identifier molecule, okay, maybe that's even in the few hundred base pairs long. But what would that thing represent? You know, we've, we've made it out of these shorter DNA sequences and both because of that self-assembly characteristic to kind of get them to line up in a way that we want to, if we combine the right liquids with the right DNA fragments together, we can program how they're gonna arrange. Um, and then we can actually firm those bonds up by adding some enzymes that do this and actually will stitch them together more permanently. But what if each of these identifier molecules essentially represents a slot in an address space? And so every one of these several hundred base pair DNA sequence molecules that we've created is an address. And we actually can impose an order on them so we know what slot one will be based on the order of those the fragments of DNA sequences. We know what the second slot is, the third. And maybe we say each of these identifier molecules for its slot in the overall address space our encoder decoder knows what the sequence of digits behind the scenes in the original object is that that thing is, is a signifier for. So it's, it's frankly a much more esoteric and, and you know, roundabout encoding scheme than just a simple mapping of zeros and ones to A's, T's, C's, and G's. But what this allows us to do is to not be bottlenecked by both the costs and especially the speeds, uh, really both factors, but, but the speed of having to build these chemical DNA sequences to represent data we're no longer really bound by that because we can do that in advance. We can make many copies of these DNA components. And then as long as we can use kind of lab robotics to combine them together quickly to create these identifier molecules, we can encode data. And you know, again, because of the numbers that we're using, we can store you know, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data in any given DNA identifier library or overall address space. So, we actually first started doing this using lab robotics. There are these things you could almost picture like a tape library, but instead of moving tapes around, it's moving little test tubes around, and this is what labs use in, in the, the 21st century to do all sorts of liquid combinations. Well, that wasn't gonna work fast enough. It allowed us to prove that this mechanism, this encoding scheme, indeed was much cheaper and much faster than the pure chemical synthesis techniques, but we needed to really speed this up. So what did, what did we do to do this? Well, we built this thing, which we're calling Mobius. It's several meters long by several meters wide. What, what is this thing? What does it do? Well, Mobius is a DNA data writer that of course uses inkjet printer nozzle technology to do these liquid combinations to combine our DNA component molecules to the tune of 500,000 combinations per second. In fact, our team kind of thought about what are, what are the existing technologies you know, that might allow us to do these DNA combinations. You know, they looked at kind of acoustic liquid handling equipment, which is now kind of a thing in some labs, but they actually settled on inkjets because inkjets disperse liquids in picoliter quantities. That's a thousand times smaller than a nanoliter, which is already pretty darn small. So, we can do this, we can do it rapidly, and we can essentially do it off the shelf using like commercial print 
uh, heads, which you may have heard people use to do all sorts of weird things with these days. They're printing replacement organs, they're replacing, you know, they're, they're printing lab-grown meat that someday we might eat in the grocery store when we run out of real meat. Um, but like print heads have a lot of utility simply as a very detail level uh, liquid handling device. So I mentioned it can do between five and 600,000 liquid combinations a second. That's how we actually get those DNA components together with the ones that we want to kind of design them to line up with. It, this machine, granted this is not gonna be a commercial device, at full speed it's gonna do about a 12 megabit per second write speed. Um, we're running at about a third that right now for our test run. And for a test run we actually printed the English text version of Wikipedia. Um, it was about 14 gigs of original data. We actually do put erasure coding on top of it, so it came to about 16 gigs of printed DNA data storage data, and we did it in a handful of hours, and it was by far and away the largest amount of data most quickly encoded into synthetic DNA ever. So Mobius has a few main components up at the top. You can see this bank of uh, printer nozzles and cartridges. These basically have the DNA inks as well as the enzyme inks that we use to kind of sew those DNA components together. There's this roll that disperses this plastic webbing that's going by at you know, really meters uh, per minute. And this is where essentially the nozzles print the DNA components on top of one another, and again, in a very controlled way. They go into this incubator because they want to get warmed up in order for those enzymes to actually be more efficient at sewing those DNA components together. The sheets kind of come off into this pool that collects it, sort of falls off uh, because the, the webbing itself is hydrophobic, so we run it through this liquid and the, the DNA ink essentially falls off and those are a bunch of those little um, identifier molecules that collect in the liquid. We essentially clean the liquid up. We can condense all of the liquid out and, and end up basically with a tiny, tiny little nugget of data that lives at the bottom of a test tube. So to show you a little more specifically, these are how small the dots are you know, that's 150 micrometers between each of the dot locations that it's printing. And then on the right here, and I'll show you kind of quickly, this isn't the whole machine doing its entire thing, but you see these, what look like orange rectangles going by. Those are all of these really tiny, tiny dots next to one another that have the DNA and the enzymes printed onto each dot location for those very specific combinations to occur. And you can, you can see it going in uh, to the collecting vat there. And so of course, those orange sheets aren't solid. They really are a bunch of microscopic little dots. It's just like when you look at an illustration that you've printed on an inkjet printer, it looks like a solid thing. But if you were to go under a microscope, it really is all of these very tiny little dots. And we really just took advantage of that for its liquid handling uh, potential for us. Certainly a unique approach. So. Uh, we have a development roadmap for Mobius that really puts it more in the realm of being a useful data storage system for us. So our goal is in the next couple of years, roughly two to three years, which is our Series A, we're doing our Series A financing uh, raise right now, um, we're gonna build a machine that's a thousand times faster. So that sounds crazy, but we actually have a decent number of levers we can push and pull and buttons we can press proverbially to speed this whole process up. We can make the webbing move more quickly and actually make it a continuous run, so it's a little more Mobius-like, actually. Um, you know, we can make the dots smaller, we can use more inks. Again, the encoding scheme itself is very extensible. So we want to build one in a couple of years that's a thousand times faster. That'll let us do between 100 and 125 terabytes a day, which actually is pretty useful if you have, say, a movie master in 4K that maybe is about, a, you know, again, just for the, the movie itself, not all of the constituent materials, but maybe 10 terabytes or so for a 4K master. You know, this allows us to potentially get multiple of those uh, produced by a single machine per day. So it will be kind of low gigabit per second speeds per system. And you know, we think there's a path from there as well, but this is just our two to three year goal. And you know, we also have to improve reading. And if you hadn't figured this out, I mean, reading is handled by off the shelf DNA sequencers, right? We're using models that the, the leading DNA sequencing company Illumina builds. Um, even though it's synthetic DNA molecules, the machines read it just as if it's a regular biological DNA sequence. Now there's a whole new class of DNA sequencers that are coming online that use what are called nanopores. 
and imagine a, a medium that has very little slots for DNA molecules to fall through, and they essentially can generate voltage and signal as they go through these little teeny, teeny holes. Now, the problem with nanopores is that they're not actually that great for sequencing with base level resolution. You don't necessarily pick up every last A, T, C, and G. But catalog doesn't need every last A, T, C, or G identified. All we need to do is be able to tell each of those unique identifier molecules, which is actually several hundred bases long, apart from one another. Because our encoders and decoders already know what each one stands in for as far as the bits it represents. So again, it's actually another benefit we get to not going quite as dense as base level resolution for each bit. So we actually think that nanopore will be ideal for us and could represent a significant leap that we want to bring to sequencing of specifically this class of DNA molecule that's used for arbitrary data storage. So I talked about wanting to compute on this data directly. And I talked about some of the reasons why DNA as a data storage molecule is inherently computable. We are computing right now, as I said. So some of the types of things we think that this will be useful for, and I alluded to this earlier, finding patterns in your DNA data set without having to pay an indexing penalty because of this quality to stick the, the magnet into the, the haystack and suck out the needle. But those patterns could be everything from a string of text to a machine learning model that you've generated that now you want to perform what's called inference. You want to find matches for a machine learning model against an underlying data set. Imagine if you could do that very quickly without having to index the data. Because even when you do that today with machine learning models and you're inferring against the data set what are likely matches, you st it still has to go through and perform a lot of calculations to do that. We think we can do that more naturally and it's almost inherently. Um, there's all sorts of other hyper-parallelized computation we could perform. This could be everything from you know, basic operations, algebraic, you know, basic types of things you execute in programs as functions. Um, this could be digital signal processing techniques. There's a lot of interesting types of parallel processing. In fact, this is like the ultimate parallel processing platform because every bit can kind of be addressed simultaneously. And as I said earlier, this really is true in storage in memory computing because you have totally converged these two sides of what we think of as computers, the storage elements and the compute elements, into a single platform. So we are doing pilot projects. In fact, we're, we're going to be beginning the pilot projects more officially at the beginning of this new year in, in early 2020. We actually have to move the machine over from the organization where it was actually assembled in the UK. It's going to come over to our office in Boston. And we are actively looking for pilot users to sign up. Um, these are really proof of concept projects. And we're certainly looking at media and entertainment and people who have a lot of high value assets that this could be an interesting use case for. But we're also looking at other industries, banking and finance, the energy industry, you know, industrial organizations, uh, insurance, anyone really who has big data sets and also really wants to perform a lot of rapid data analytics and querying against those big data sets that today's technologies really can't hold up for so well. So we are doing these soon. If people are interested in potentially being a pilot, if you're in a major media organization or if you are in a different industry, but maybe more like a Fortune 100, you can certainly reach out to me at nick at catalogdna.com and we can talk about whether you're a right fit for our pilot process. And with that said, and I know that this was a lot of material to digest it. Again, I'm still kind of getting there myself, and I've been with the firm for four months now. I'd be happy to entertain any questions that people have. There may be a few. Oh, thank you.